good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar of preparing the HVAC workforce of tomorrow uh, for flammable refrigerants. I'm Caroline Chico, uh, HRI's Director of Environmental Services. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of housekeeping tips with you. Um, you'll notice on the control panel on your screen, <clears throat> there is a Q&A feature. If you please use that feature to ask questions at any time during the webinar, and we will address them at the end of the session. Also note that the, record, the webinar will be recorded and it will be sent to you following the session. So now I am pleased to welcome two speakers that we have here with us today. Um, Dr. Charles Allgood <clears throat> also goes by Chuck. Um, he's currently uh, the technology leader of refrigerants with Camores Inc. in Newark, Delaware. And uh, Chuck holds a PhD in chemistry from the University in Delaware. And he has a variety of research, technical service, and market development assignments <clears throat> that he's uh, had over his 30 years in the refrigerants industry. And he currently leads technical support, training, applications development for Opteon and Freon refrigerants. And he's a frequent speaker at several HVACR industry events. Um, and we also have Tim McRae. He is a technical support and development leader for Comores Canada. And he's working in thermal and specialized solutions uh, business. So over uh, Tim's 30 year career with Comores, which was previously known as DuPont, he's held a variety of functions in sales, research, product development, regulatory and customer technical service in the refrigerants business. And <clears throat> Tim is a graduate of the mechanical engineering technology program from Red River College in Winnipeg. Um, so, gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. And uh, Tim, I'm going to give you the stage now and pass it over to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. If we could flip to the next slide, please. Yeah, so anyway, first of all, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us today. I know we have all very busy schedules and and certainly those of you that are, are, are service technicians and uh, even uh, wholesalers in the industry, I would like to thank you for your efforts uh, through COVID. Uh, I know you guys are, are uh, in my mind, some of the real heroes in keeping our grocery stores going and, and keeping the food flowing, so, so thank you. Uh, the agenda today, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, several things, a regulatory uh, introduction to refrigerants that are in these uh, the classes, uh, applications of flammable refrigerants, codes and standards, and also uh, something on safe handling and uh, some refrigerant educational resources. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing is environmental considerations. Uh, it should be no news to anybody about uh, the ozone depleting substances regulations and the phase out of, of CFCs and HCFCs, but certainly climate change or global warming uh, um, is another environmental consideration that is coming up more and more and more. And this is the uh, impact of uh, global warming products uh, basically trapping heat into the atmosphere, much like the greenhouse effect you would see in your car on a hot day. Uh, so that is certainly uh, an environmental consideration that's becoming more and more, and we're seeing uh, regulatory uh, things coming into place in this area. Uh, next slide, please. This again should be no news to anybody with the ozone depleting substances regulations. Uh, HCFCs uh, are uh, in Canada uh, going away. Uh, we, we are no longer allowed to manufacture or import uh, HCFCs into the country. Uh, certainly HCFCs can still be used in existing equipment and product that's in country can be used for service and that type of thing. And uh, 123 is available uh, as uh, for uh, service gas as well. There is a small amount of that uh, available as well. Uh, next slide, please. So around climate change, there are climate change regulations in Canada today. 
there are two parts to the climate change regulations. One is the is the cap and reduction, which has already started with a 10% reduction. Uh, this is really the Kigali amendments to the Montreal Protocol. There's also specific prohibitions for new equipment, for new equipment only, where lower GWP sol solutions existed, you know, when Environment Canada created the regulations. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the cap and reduction. So Environment Canada took, uh, you know, all of the imports of, of HCFCs into the country, you know, multiplied each one by its GWP and they came up with a number for the country. And then what happens in alignment with Kigali, there's a, a reduction. We've already been reduced in Canada by 10%. The next reduction is in 2024, which will reduce us down to 60%. A couple of important things in this chart is that it is a phase down, it is not a phase out. HFCs are not being phased out, they're being phased down. The other important thing that this also includes automotive refrigerants, foaming agents, propellants, aerosols, all these types of things. And these other applications are contributing significantly in us getting to the 2036 reduction. But certainly there will need to be additional low GWP uh, refrigerants required to get us to 2036 reduction. Next slide, please. So this is the other part of the regulations in Canada. It's the uh, specific prohibitions on different sectors where lower GWP solutions existed. So you will see at the bottom automotive and foam uh, has already moved the beginning of this year to low GWP solutions. And some of our sectors in refrigeration like condensing units already has a GWP limit of 2200. And one could say this is for new equipment, but to use the wording of Environment Canada, it's for equipment that's manufactured or imported. Uh, but you can see on the right hand side, GWP 404A, 507, you can see that their GWPs are 3900. So as an example, in condensing units, you would no longer be able to use 404 or 507 in new condensing units. Uh, you'll also see an additional one coming up in 2025, a GWP limit of 750 for uh, refrigeration and air conditioning chillers. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side, you'll see there uh, Quebec, uh, the, if you are in the province of Quebec, the regulations there are slightly different um, and certainly that's something to review, but uh, there are slightly different regulations uh, in Quebec. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the U.S., we don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, in the U.S., a lot of our equipment comes from the United States. Uh, but the good news is the United States uh, is moving ahead with similar regulations under the AMAC. So we fully expect uh, the U.S. to have similar GWP cap and reduction and also sector-based restrictions similar to Canada in the very new future. Uh, next slide, please. So th that kind of concludes the, the regulatory side around where the regulations are going. So now I'll hand it over to uh, Chuck Allgood to talk more about uh, the refrigerant flammability, the new classes and uh, some of the flammability testing. So, so Chuck, welcome. And if uh, you could take it to the next section, please. Sure, thanks, Tim. And let me add my uh, thanks to everyone for all the work uh, you do and for taking time to be with us today. I think, uh, you know, if this is the first uh, you're hearing about from the refrigerants, that's good. I think there's a lot of information you're going to want to learn and keep up to date on. So this it will be a continuing education uh, process for our entire industry um, over the next several years as we move to this lower GWP future. Uh, Tim did a great job of, of laying out the regulatory landscape and, and where we're moving in terms of GWP. And the natural consequence of going to lead lower GWP is going to be a move to more flammable type refrigerants. It has to do with the basic chemistry of the refrigerants we use. When you incorporate more hydrogen into the molecules, uh, not getting into a big chemistry discussion here, but things that give them short atmospheric lifetimes and low GWP are also the things that tend to increase flammability. So you see them here on this uh, teeter totter. Uh, graphic on the left, but as GWP goes down, we're going to uh, 
deal more and more with flammable and mildly flammable refrigerants. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. We can see where all this is headed, but we still have to keep in mind what we, it's not just a one issue uh, problem that what the industry is facing. It's not just GWP, it's not just flammability. We still have to have refrigerants that have good uh, performance in terms of uh, cooling capacity, energy efficiency. The systems have to be uh, affordable in terms of capital and maintenance, service costs, uh, energy costs. Uh, so there's a lot of things to be balanced uh, and we're trying to aim for this kind of sweet spot in the middle. We want them to be environmentally sustainable and safe, uh, non-ozone depleting low GWP and, uh, and mitigate any flammability risk. So that, that's our overall goal as an industry and as a refrigerant manufacturer. If we can go on to the next slide. Uh, just want to ground everybody, if you're not totally familiar with uh, flammable refrigerant definitions, and this is right out of ASHRAE standard 34. And by and far, most refrigerants um, we're all familiar with working with over the last few decades have been what are classified as A1. The A or B designation refers to the toxicity, lower or higher toxicity, and then 1, 2, 2, L3 uh, is the flammability. So A1 would be things we're all familiar with, 404, 134A, 410A, uh, et cetera. And then the threes uh, have been around, but have, have been in pretty limited use because they are the highly flammable or almost explosive refrigerants like propane, butane. So a big world of difference uh, between those two refrigerants. And where we're really talking here, moving as an industry is in this 2L, A2L category. Uh, sometimes referred to as mildly flammable or lower flammability. And uh, they are very different. There's a lot of things that are similar to the, the A1s, the non-flammables, but there's uh, other things that need to be considered. So one of the take homes I want you to hopefully get today is what things are changing, what things are not, what do you have to do differently, what, what's going to be the same, um, because the A2Ls are the refrigerants that we're going to be dealing with uh, um, a lot going into the future. So if you look at the next chart, it goes into some of the um, basic flammability metrics that are measured when you're actually running the standard to determine if something, a class three or class one, these are the properties that are look, looked at. And I won't go into too much detail for time reasons here, but the basic one, the lower and upper flammability limit, that's how much of, a, of, of the substance has to be present in the air, um, presumably due to a leak, uh, to reach a mixture that could be uh, ignited or become flammable. So you'll hear the LFL talked about a lot, the lower flammability limit. There's also other metrics like the minimum ignition energy. This is how much of a spark is required. Once I reach the LFL, then I have to look for an ignition source. And what kind of spark or ignition source is required to ignite it? Is that a, a static spark of static electricity enough? Or does it take something like a, you know, a torch to set these things off? Burning velocity is really the speed of the flame propagation. So does this uh, flammable mixture that I have, once it's ignited, does it burn more like a birthday uh, candle or is this a, a you know, ball of flame or a blowtorch? And that's uh, very important. We'll show some differences between some of the classes with some of these things. And finally, heat of combustion is another one. How much energy is actually given off when this stuff burns? Uh, so these are all the things uh, that are looked at. And if we go into the next chart, this is basically the, uh, the standard ASTM method for determined flammability. So this is basically a, a flask and you, it starts out filled with air and you add a refrigerant to it that you think might be flammable. And then once it's filled with a known composition, you ignite a spark and you see if you get flame uh, extension or if you get this stuff to burn. And if not, then you go into a little more and you, you work your way through it. And then you can determine if you never get a ignition, then it's classified as A1. Uh, non-flammable, uh, but then if you get it to cross this 90 degree arc as the test method has uh, standardized, then it's to determine that it is flammable and then you can measure some of the uh, the other metrics. And I think I visually here on some of the next charts, we just show a little bit about uh, some of the different ones so we can move to the next chart. Um, this one is not the actual burning ver uh, velocity apparatus, but it, it looks very similar to it. And this is a comparison of uh, two A2L class refrigerants versus an A3. So you have propane on the right 
and something uh, that's mildly flammable like 1234YF or R32 on the left. And you basically fill the tube with a flammable mixture, you ignite it, and then you uh, watch the flame, how fast it goes. And so these are all snapshots uh, from a video and they're all taken uh, eight one hundreds after ignition. So on the far right, you can see obviously very flammable, very high burning velocity. It basically fills the entire tube. It's even coming out the end of the tube, if you can see it up top there. So that's what a highly flammable one would look like compared to the two L's. So you do get some ignition, you get a little bit of a burning thing, but it's nowhere uh, as severe or as fast uh, as the propane is in this type of uh, test. So we can look at the next chart. Uh, this is another one of the metrics. This is the minimum ignition energy. So again, comparing A2L refrigerants up top and an A3 on the bottom. And, and again, if you look, uh, what you do here is put the flammable mixture in a flask and then you have a very um, defined energy source. So down the bottom with the propane, these are things that are measured in one millijoule of energy. So one millijoule is enough to, again, ignite the propane. You get a very vigorous uh, ignition. You can see it actually blows the cap off the top. The flame goes up into the laboratory hood where this was done. And just compare that to the one above on the upper right, R32. Now notice at one millijoule, nothing happens. So they keep cranking up the energy. And finally, you get to 100 millijoules, so 100 times the energy. And then you get an ignition of the R32. And again, you see it's not nearly as extreme. And then over on the upper left, you can even go up to 100, 500, even up to 1,000 millijoules and you do not get ignition of the uh, 1234YF. So again, a good visual and uh, measurable demonstration that there are real differences between the, the class three flammable refrigerants and, and the two L's. So next chart, please. So, so here's a plot of, uh, of minimum ignition energy versus the uh, lower flammability limit. So this is, starts to group some of these flammability metrics together. And of course, down here in the lower left is where you're going to be at the highest uh, risk of, you know, a, an ignition event. So things you would expect to see down there with very low ignition energy, that means it's easy to ignite and very low flammability limits. That is, you don't take much of a leak or much of the substance to get it to burn. Things like acetylene, gasoline, propane, you can see they're all clustered down in this lower left. I'd also point the up and down scale on the y-axis there is a logarithmic scale. So this isn't just linear. You're going from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000. And again, you can see where the 2L uh, flammabilities, the YF way up there in the upper right, and then R32 down below. Again, this is just another way of sorting through different flammability classes and uh, with the hopes to develop standards and then codes and handling practices that uh, appropriately uh, deal with the risk and, and mitigating the risks. So on to the next slide. Um, this is again talking about ignition sources and we talked about minimum ignition energy. So this was a report AHRI did a, a couple of years ago, looking at potential things, can these uh, items, common items that may be around where you're gonna be working uh, serve as an ignition source? And, and this isn't a definitive, but it, it, it certainly gives you a good sense of things like light switches or hair dryers, toasters, uh, even a, a barbecue sparker igniter do not have enough energy to ignite an A2L. So you really have to look up top here when you get into actual you know, open flames, a match, a very hot wire, um, certainly a brazing torch or something like that. Then you can get these ignition here. Um, so a lot of these other things, power tools and stuff, are not going to be sources of ignition, which, again, they're going to help inform our work practices and our training going forward. The next chart, please. Again, uh, so here's a, a bunch of different refrigerants, and we can kind of look through, and I won't go through every number on this chart. Uh, we're going to provide the charts, and there's a lot of detail in these that I won't uh, speak to. But you can see, uh, I think this gives a good visual comparison again against those flammability metrics and comparing something so let, maybe let's let's look at the propane column and a3 and the 1234yf which is a very common a2l uh, refrigerant so no matter which of these you're looking at you can see the difference whether it's a lower flammability limit you know it doesn't take a lot 2.2 of the propane versus 6.2 of the yf um, 
The range between the upper and lower flammability limits, again, is another thing. The minimum ignition energy we've talked about, 0.25 versus over 5,000. That's a huge difference. Uh, the S sub U there, that's the burning velocity, again, 46 centimeters per second versus 1.5 and as well as heat of combustion, which I mentioned a while back, that's how much energy is given off when these things do actually burn. So again, see big differences in those numbers. So again, this is all just to help you understand, you know, we really are dealing with something that's a, a new class. And, and that's why ASHRAE even developed the A2L classes. There was a big recognition uh, from the standards group and the, and the OEMs and the people working on that, that these really need to be treated different. They're not one non-flammable, but they're not three uh, highly flammable either. So we can go on, please. Hopefully this video will show. This is not uh, our video, but it, and you can find it online. I think the link is on there, but it basically uh, has the gentleman here with a, a torch uh, connected directly to a, a cylinder of refrigerant. On the right-hand side, obviously it's a, a hydrocarbon, and you can see with that sparking thing there, you can get it and basically make a a propane or butane torch, whatever that happens to be, probably propane. And you can see on the left, um, hopefully the video is running here. It may get bogged down a little bit. I encourage you to check it out online. But you just see with that sparker, it's really difficult to even get any flame. If you look closely, you see it looks like it burns a little bit, but it's really doesn't, it's not sustainable. It doesn't continue on. Again, another very good visual thing. And uh, check out the link if you get a chance. Uh, next chart, please. All right, so just a little uh, overall flammability takeaways here. I, I hope I, I showed you enough uh, uh, data here to, to convince you that A2Ls are, you know, they're very different than A3s. They're more difficult to ignite. Uh, it takes a lot stronger uh, ignition source. The leaks are going to have to be a lot more severe. Um, the burning velocity, they don't propagate well, um, but they can burn. So we knew, do need to take that into uh uh, account and when I come back here after Tim talks a little bit about some other stuff, we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of the handling things here. But uh, we're going to be able to use these in industry going forward. Uh, there's a lot of work going into the systems, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, here in the in the future. Next chart, please. Okay, so we're going to move into applications. Where are we going to see flammable refrigerants, and where we've seen them? So if we go to the next chart because they, they have been around. They're, they're not new. Most, most of you may have not have worked with them, but uh, unless you happen to work on propane systems, which tend to be very small, uh, small factory filled systems, um, bottle coolers, maybe some vending machines and stuff. But the A2Ls have been out there for a while, probably going on 10 years now. Obviously, the automotive industry has been the first one. And, and Tim and I both support the automotive industry. Uh, I realized that you know in the service side of things, a lot of automotive is kind of separate. So the people who are servicing automotive uh, vehicles aren't always uh, working in the stationary world. But there are millions, probably hundreds of millions of cars uh, on the road that have 1234YF, have this mildly uh, flammable refrigerant in it. And uh, it's been there, it's been performing well uh, for the past 10 years. So th that gives us some learning and some, some confidence as we start moving into flammable refrigerants in the stationary sector. So if we go to the next chart, where do we expect these to uh, be showing up and when? Um, the, a lot of the work, and Tim will cover this, is, is based, gonna be based on industry standards and on building codes. And these really determine the places and the spaces and the equipment types um, that are going to be seeing flammable refrigerants and kind of what order those things will be coming out. So uh, I mentioned an example, we already have propane in small charge self-contained systems. We have YF in mobile air conditioning and we have R32, another A2L uh, in the US particularly and internationally, I'd say globally, you know, it's available in small uh, air conditioning units. If you think window uh, room air conditioners, PTAC units, um, and that's been out there for years, but really the big areas coming soon are going to be in our traditional uh, residential ducted split systems. Things like R54B is one of the leading A2L replacements for 410A. And then on commercial refrigerant side, there's a, uh, 454A and C. Those are also uh, 
they're kind of designed to match 404A properties, but they are, again, very low GWP and mildly flammable. So that's where we're going to be seeing those things coming soon. And if we go to the next chart, um, I mentioned the PTAX. I mentioned you know, the A2Ls being, you know, and uh, several global OEMs have announced, you know, 454B as being their choice uh, for their 410A fleets when they start coming out with new, new systems. It's got a little bit lower GWP than R32. We think that's going to be important, as uh, Tim showed in the uh, phase down. We're not going to phase out of these refrigerants, but there's going to be pressure to limit the overall GWP of our entire footprint. So the standards and codes work has been going on. A lot of it's wrapping up. There's still some work to be doing. And again, there's a number of uh, industry transition task force, a lot of education and training uh, going on. And uh, we'll, we'll hit on that again at the end. But if we can go to the uh, next chart, please. Uh, looking at commercial refrig, where things like 407 or 404, 507, even a lot of R22 was used traditionally. I want to be clear that there is going to be a need for A1, non-flammable refrigerants, to service or retrofit or convert a lot of that uh, uh, equipment that's still going to be running for a long time. Uh, that still has to be non-flammable. If it was designed for non-flammable, it's got to have non-flammable refrigerants. So there are lower GWP refrigerants, 449A, 448, uh, as examples, that is going to, into a lot of existing systems. And that will continue. That's not going to phase out. But when we look at going to new systems, that's where you know the opportunity comes for new lower GWP using mildly flammable refrigerants uh, comes in. So there's a lot of different systems out there, and there will be a mix of this uh, depending on the end user, depending on regulations, depending on the time, uh, you know, what year it is and what uh, deadlines are coming. But again, we see those uh, lower GWP flammable refrigerants coming in. Um, will they ever be in a huge supermarket rack with, you know, 1,000 uh, pounds of, 1,000 uh, uh, kgs of uh, refrigerant in there? Uh, we don't know. Personally, I don't think so. I think the supermarket industry is moving to a lot of different architectures and a lot of different uh, types of systems to help with energy. It will also reduce charge size. So all that will be factored in where and when exactly flammable show up uh, in new commercial refrigerant equipment. You can go to the next chart, please. So I think I'll hand it back over to Tim at this point and he'll get into some of the standards and codes and then I'll be back with you to talk a little bit about some of the real practical uh, handling and work practices. So Tim, what Okay. Do you... Yep, thanks Chuck. Okay, if we could uh, flip to the next slide, please. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, the adoption process in Canada. Um, now, some of the uh, codes and standards in Canada are, are kind of derivatives or depend upon some of the international or US standards. So there's several to be aware of. Uh, as an example, ASHRAE standard 34, Chuck mentioned that, ASHRAE standard 15, uh, which is sort of the US version of the Canadian CSA B52. Uh, they kind of work hand in hand in some ways. B52 refers to ASHRAE standard 15. There's also a new one that's near completion, ASHRAE standard 15.2, which is gonna deal with A2Ls in um, air conditioning uh, systems. So where we stand today, um, the, oh, I should also mention the other two, uh, there's a couple of uh, UL CSA standards that really apply to the design or building requirements of equipment. Uh, like the 2-89 on the left and 2-40 on the right uh, for the different types of equipment. So they, the manufacturers of uh, equipment will be required to follow these standards in building the equipment. Now, where we stand today with CSA B52, uh, A2Ls are in there, but only in a very limited way. And, and even in the UL or CSA standards, uh, hydrocarbons can be used A2Ls can be used in very limited charge sizes, typically about 150 grams. Uh, within B52, there may be some other areas where A2Ls could be applied, but uh, these standards like B52 and also the NBC, National Building Code and the National Fire Code 
are also being uh, updated and revised as well to include this new class of refrigerants called A2Ls. This takes some time. We're still a few years away, I think, before uh, B52 is done uh, or with the next revisions to advance the A2Ls, uh, likely to be completed in 2022. Uh, in the U.S., some of the codes are already in adopted. In some states, you can move ahead with uh, A2Ls, but broadly in North America, the A2Ls are very limited, as are the A3s and uh, very small charge systems. So flip to the next slide, please. So, so B52, uh, I want to show you this. You can see that some of the provinces, like if you look at uh, a, a British Columbia right at the top, so B-52 was, a, was updated, uh, the last revision was 2018. So British Columbia is still working towards even adopting the, uh, uh, the 2018 version. So, so once B-52 is done, it still takes some time for the provinces to adopt. So I'm trying to convey the message that we're still a few years away before we see you know, a greater adoption of A2Ls and, and, and larger systems. So um, next slide, please. So this just quickly shows uh, the national building code. Sometimes we call them the national model codes. So again, some of the provinces will adopt the codes as is. So you can see New Brunswick, Manitoba, they generally adopt pretty much the national building code as is, may reward it a little bit. But if we slip to the next slide, you will see that some of the provinces like Ontario and Quebec essentially uh, write their own code based on that. So again, even once the national codes are adopted, it's gonna take a few years. So we're still a few years away from uh, adoption uh, at all the provinces of, you know, the latest uh, procedures and guidelines on how to use A2Ls. Uh, next slide, please. So, so that's kind of where it's at with the, you know, the, the uh, building code. So we're still a few years away there's some limited use of A2Ls and small equipment, but we're gonna see broader adoption, you know, as the new codes get uh, put into place. So I'll hand it back to Chuck for uh, a section on safe handling and work practices. Great, thanks, Tim. And, and, and let me just say, I, I wanna be respectful of your time and I wanna make sure we leave time for questions at the end. So there's a lot of uh, information here and you're gonna to wanna to probably get, uh, you know, several doses of of a training here. So I'm gonna go through this at, at a pretty high level, but again, you know, feel free to re review the slides and then you can always reach out if you have any questions. But um, the safety and handling strategy for A2Ls, you know, is, is grounded in a few fundamental principles we have here. And the first one I kind of touched on, but flammable refrigerants are only gonna be applied or used in systems that were designed specifically to use flammable refrigerants. And this is why the standards uh, work is so important. So we can be in compliance with that. Um, you know, that will govern uh, charge sizes. And if the, uh, if the equipment has doors on it, if it's a cooler or it doesn't have doors, there will be slight differences. Um, but again, we're not gonna be putting flammable refrigerants, even A2Ls in equipment that was designed for a non-flammable refrigerant. So uh, that's important to always keep in mind. Um, so when we talk about how do we use A2Ls safely, it's really, since it's going to be a new equipment, it's, it's, it's the design and installation following those standards that are being developed and the codes and local regulations. And the codes more talk about, you know, the spaces and places where uh, this equipment using flammables can be. If it has a flammable refrigerant, can it be in the, uh, and it's a place of uh, public gathering, you know, can we have a flammable refrigerant in a, in a lobby or in a hallway? If we have a flammable refrigerant in an ice machine, can that be where we usually see ice machines in, uh, in hotels and, uh, and those type of things? The equipment itself, uh, you know, is going to have, when it's built for these A2Ls, a, a kind of built in what we call leak detection and mitigation. So if the system were to leak, the first line of defense is going to be the systems that are on board to detect that leak and do some mitigation. And this will differ. The mitigation uh, strategy will vary by OEM and by equipment, but you can imagine it may turn off a valve. It may de-energize things. It may turn on a fan 
to increase ventilation so you don't reach a flammable limit. It may uh, uh, trigger some other events and, and, and alarm. So there's a lot of different uh, strategies being put in detection and mitigation, but that will all be coming uh, with the equipment uh, for a lot of the air conditioning uh, standard equipment you're used to seeing today. Um, the other part of that is that, you know, ventilation is our, gonna be our friend all along here. So whether we're servicing something or installing it and it's part of the mitigation plan, uh, ventilation, so we never get to a, the LFL, never get to a flammable uh, concentration is the first line of defense. And quickly followed by is eliminating um, ignition sources. So we don't wanna have anything around in the area even if we were to get to the LFL, that could serve as an ignition source. So a lot of that basic work we talked about, you know, tools, um, light switches, what can be an ignition source, what can't, all that is gonna factor in how we uh, approach uh, the safe handling of these refrigerants. And then the third part here is the properly trained workforce. That's kind of what we're doing here starting today. It will be an ongoing effort by the industry, by OEMs, by refrigerant suppliers, by training organizations, trade organizations. I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, opportunity and a lot of different uh, methods for getting our workforce trained, but there is a big recognition that you know everyone needs to be up to speed on handling of uh, H2L refrigerants. So if we go into the next slide, please. <clears throat> Again, uh, the flammable refrigerants are only gonna be a new equipment. They're gonna follow standards and codes. They're not gonna be used in retrofit. And the installation of this equipment, uh, you know, is going to be a little bit different. So it's important if you're an installer or that's part of your work that you follow, read, understand all the installation instructions uh, that are going to come from the equipment manufacturer. Certain things uh, will be different. A lot of things will be the same, but uh, making sure the installation goes according to plan and then Further down the line, when that equipment needs to be serviced, making sure all the work practices, tools, uh, and everything, and I'll get into some details if we go to the next chart um, on what some of that means. So um, I think I uh, I think I covered this. So let's uh, skip over this one in the interest of time. Go to um, uh, this one is uh, important to point out: no odorant or no uh, stenching agent. So, so if you're familiar with, uh, you know, fuel grade propane, uh, whether it's for your gas grill or you have uh, natural gas into your house, you know, there's a, a sulfur compounds are added that to give it a scent. That is not the case in refrigerant grade flammable refrigerants, even propane or the A2Ls. Um, those type of organic compounds will not survive. Long term inside of a, an equipment where it's just being, you know, pressure cycled, temperature cycled over and over, those things will tend to break down and will cause system problems. So we're not going to be relying on our nose uh, as a leak detector here, which is good because your nose is not really calibrated. And it's uh, it's just important to point out that our traditional handheld leak detectors or we have area monitors are going to be very, very important going forward. So in the next chart. Um, you know, dealing with returnable cylinders, I won't read through every one of these. Uh, I think a lot of this can go under the best practices or let's revisit our best practices, but, you know, care and respect for our, our cylinders. Uh, certainly uh, in the past, we would get cylinders back that it looked like there was some evidence that you know, some people had applied some flames or torches to them to, you know, heat them up and build up pressure if it was cold out. Uh, not a best practice, certainly discourage that. And you really don't want to be doing that when we get to flammable refrigerants. But making sure that mechanical and physical integrity, uh, you know, they're not rusted, the valves are in good shape, we don't uh, force uh, things open. All those good practices around cylinders are going to continue uh, as we move to A2Ls. And on to the next chart. Again, this is more of the, of the uh, uh, best practices, I would say. You want to watch out for moisture and rust. Uh, and color. Uh, the industry is in process of transitioning. You know, everything used to be colors. It was a lot simpler when we had a few refrigerants. We have more and more refrigerants. So I think the industry in overall is eventually going to get to all uh, uniform color, probably gray. Uh, so it's going to be important to read the labels. We hope you read the labels anyway, but uh, going forward, uh, it's kind of going to force the issue. So if you weren't aware that change is coming, uh, it is. Uh, some places it's rolled out already, and some it hasn't, but uh, 
certainly that is coming down the road, something you want to be aware of. So the next chart, uh, probably one of the, uh, you know, the, the riskiest areas, I'd say, you know, hot work with a you know, brazing torch or any welding, that type of stuff. Really want to take care and revisit those best practices when it comes to A2L. Again, you need training, you need to be qualified before you break out a brazing torch. But again, ventilation and purging is our is our friend here. So, you know, recovering all the refrigerant out of there should be done regardless of refrigerant, particularly with flammable refrigerants, pulling a vacuum and then purging with nitrogen. So purging with nitrogen when you're brazing has always been a best practice. It avoids contamination. Um, from copper uh, slag, copper oxide inside, but certainly with uh, flammable refrigerants, even more important, as well as ventilating the area, cordoning off the area. I see a barricade down there on the lower right. You really want to set yourself up for safe practices. Make sure, you know, nobody's getting in your work area where you're going to be working. Clear a good space, and uh, don't forget your uh, PPE that you should always have, including, you know, hand and eye protection, especially when doing hot work. So on to the next chart. Uh, again, purging is important. To, uh, make sure your torch is in good shape. Uh, lubricant can burn itself. So even if you had the refrigerant out of there, you'd be careful with oil. Uh, make sure the system's open. And uh, the last below down here at the bottom, this thing we call flame enhancement. Uh, you know, in the uh, good old days, well, not the good old days, but the old days, you know, a torch was used as a leak detector in, in a number of cases, and you could walk around with a torch, and if there was any refrigerant around, you would see this uh, change in the flame, a change in color or, or, or enlargement, we call it flame enhancement. Um, should not be should not be using that to uh, leak detect. We want to use uh, regular leak detectors. And if you do notice any flame enhancement, that's really telling you, you probably don't have good enough ventilation, so you should shut down that work and uh, redouble down on ventilation and purging uh, to make sure, because any refrigerant you have there, it gets in a flame, it can generate some decomposition products, some acid uh, compounds that aren't particularly nice. You're not gonna wanna uh, get those up your nose or breathe those in. Okay, can we go to the next chart, please? Uh, recovery refrigerant. Um, you know, this is standard practice for any refrigerant. However, the recovery uh, machines are going to be need to be uh, certified or rated for A2Ls. This is the one piece of equipment where you're going to have to check and you may need to get uh, a new equipment um, based on how those were designed. They are available out there. I think on the next uh, chart, we have some pictures of them, um, but a number of uh, leading vendors, uh, the usual suspects who uh, you sell this equipment uh, have out there if you ask and if you check uh, our A2L rated uh, recovery equipment. So the next chart, and it's just a picture of some of those. We can go on, skip on to the next one, please. And again, all these recovery practices, making sure you don't overfill your cylinders, your cylinders are properly inspected, always important. Uh, transporting these properly, uh, storing them properly, all important for all refrigerants. So we can go on. Uh, again, I, I kind of echoed this theme a number of times, but it really is revisiting best practices, things we've done all along, you know, getting trained, uh, certified, uh, especially as we go to A2Ls. Preventing leaks and maintenance is going to be even more important. All these good practices, especially when we're uh, brazing around purging and ventilation, uh, leak detectors. A lot of the new refrigerants are going to be blends. So all we learned over blend with blends over the last 30 years on taking liquid out of the cylinder, uh, using dew point to set the superheat, setting the controls properly, all that very, very important, as well as quality refrigerant. Anytime there's a change in the refrigeration industry, uh, you have to be aware of potentially counterfeit refrigerant or uh, poor quality refrigerant that kind of uh, sneaks in there. So uh, my advice has always been, always get your refrigerant from a supplier you know and trust. Uh, let price be your guide. If you get a price that's very, very uh, unbelievable or sounds too good to be true, especially if it's an internet deal, uh, be very wary of that because uh, there, there are incidents that happen. Okay, on to the next chart. I think uh, just a couple charts here to finish up on uh, educational resources, at least from the Kamor side, if we can go on to the next one. We have a number of things out. Oh, this is the AHR, AHR, 
AI, I'll read it correctly. Um, again, uh, Caroline mentioned that, you know, there's going to be training coming through here. I think they're still uh, getting feedback and, and determining exactly what that's going to look like. Uh, so I'd say stay tuned to, for that. If they want to comment here in a few minutes, uh, they can tell you what uh, they see coming down the road. If we go into the next chart, um, just some Comores resources. We've been, you know, we've been around for a long time. So we have a lot of stuff online. Our websites are there. Anything from kind of hardcore engineering consultations. We do a lot of, uh, you know, safety handling training like this about the new products. And as usual, all our PT charts, thermal properties, all that stuff uh, is posted online. It's pretty easy to access. And I think the next chart will probably be our last one. Um, again, we're on social media. There, I uh, I do a little bit of a a, a video uh, blog here. We're talking about anything refrigerant related. So I, some of these issues we talked about today are included there, but a lot of other stuff. Uh, it's a good source of really short uh, video clips. Uh, they're all on YouTube, and again, our other social media. So a number of different ways to get the information. So we. We don't want anyone to go without information here. So I think, uh, go to the next one. I think that wraps it up. Tim, I don't know if you have any closing here or we want to go right into the questions, but I will stop talking here and, and just thank everyone for their participation so far. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Um, the Q and A's, if you want, we can, uh, Caroline, if you want to jump right into that. I've, I've looked at some of the Q and A's and can respond to some of those verbally, I suppose. Yeah, uh, for sure. We'll go into the Q&As. And I think, Tim, you touched on this in your presentation when you talked about the maximum R290 charge in a single system. So, uh, yeah, so, so typically today, um, uh, the limit is about 150 grams. It may vary depending on the jurisdiction. But uh, generally speaking, we are seeing R290, uh, which is an A3 of propane or our 600A, we are seeing some of these hydrocarbons in, as an example, spot merchandisers. So we are seeing some of that, but it's very limited to a very small charge size. Um, I, I can go through that. The next question there is about R32 is allowed in Canada. Uh, again, R32 is an A2L. Uh, I've, I have personally seen it in a window shaker, a window unit. So we will see it in some of that very small equipment. Uh, but use of any of the A2Ls in, in larger equipment is yet to be seen uh, due to the adoption of the latest uh, codes like uh, uh, UL, CSA 60335, uh, 2-40 or, or 2-89. So again, we will see some of these A2Ls and some of the small charge equipment until some of the later codes get adopted in the next few years. Uh, so... Uh, and Tim, that includes PTOX as well, too. Right? Yes, yes. Again, and it's charge size limited. But we cannot see 32 as an example in a mini split today, or we won't see it in a, you know, a residential split air conditioner uh, today because, uh, you know, the equipment needs to have all the approvals. It needs to have mitigation like leak detection and uh, mitigation on it. So we don't quite uh, see that yet. Um, okay. so the next is question there is about uh, flat, high capacity systems. So I think in chillers, uh, you know, that will be, uh, you know, again, fall into uh, CSA B52 in the mechanical room. So we will see, you know, chillers with A2Ls. But as Chuck mentioned earlier about a, uh, a supermarket, uh, you know, with a large charge, 3,000 pounds of gas, feeding the cases, uh, you know, we will likely not see that with an A2L, but what we're starting to see is the introduction of new types of equipment that will minimize charge size with possibly multiple systems. So we are seeing uh, the introduction of some new types of systems to meet the supermarket needs with A2Ls. Uh, but certainly we will see, as we know today, there are some supermarkets going in today, uh, you know, with refrigerants like 449A, 448A in the non-flammability category uh, that we will uh, see uh, installed uh, as time goes on as well. Okay, and the future of flammable refrigerants in remote condensing units. Yeah, so again, uh, that you know, we'd need to look at, uh, you know, the latest codes like B52 
uh, and, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, chillers, uh, there will be requirements and actually there are A2Ls listed in B52 today. That's one area where it may be possible to uh, install an A2L into a mechanical room with a chiller. Um, uh, but uh, that is in the, in the code today. That may be something possible, but it may depend on your local uh, AHJ, your local authority on uh, how they interpret the code. But uh, certainly we will see uh, A2Ls into applications like ice rinks, uh, as an example, uh, with the required, uh, you know, uh, meeting the uh, code requirements. Uh, an important thing there is that A2Ls, uh, 2L is the same flammability class as ammonia. So um, uh, there will be requirements, but as we know, ammonia does not require explosion proof components in the mechanical room. And it appears as though the A2Ls will, will uh, also not require explosion proof components in the mechanical room. But again, uh, you know, refer to the local HJ and also the building codes as they get revised. Um, they one of the questions they, here is, sorry. Yeah, so then how, how do you determine the maximum number of standalone refrigeration, like our 290 units in one area or room? That's a really super good question. And I don't know the answer to that. That's something that I think would need to be raised with your, your local code bodies and see how they interpret that. Because uh, as you mentioned, I mean, uh, how many can you put in a room, like in a in a hospital, in a, in a lab or this type of thing, because a lot of this equipment is coming out with, with uh, flammable. So um, that would certainly fall under B52. Uh, that would be one reference, but I think that's a, a good one to raise directly with your local code body to get an interpretation on that one. Okay, and what's the future of flammable refrigerants in commercial outdoor refrigeration units like chillers, cascade systems, and are there limitations in the charge for outdoor units? Yeah, again, if they're in a mechanical room, there, there you know, will be a fairly large charge limits. Um, if they uh, fall outside, again, it falls to B52. There will, we will see A2Ls in those applications as well. But if we get to things like walk-in coolers, uh, as an example, with a condensing unit and an evaporator coil in, you know, in the uh, walk-in cooler, uh, that will fall under uh, things like um, uh, UL CSA 60335 2-89. And there will be equations on the charge size limits for that, depending on the size of the room and the mitigation involved. Uh, so that is coming, and uh, that will uh, likely fall under um, uh, uh, CSA or uh, under um, uh, B52 code, or also directly under the um, um, UL CSA 2-89. So that will be allowed in those things like those um, walk-in cooler applications. But again, there there will be um, charts and equations used to determine the charge size limits, uh, you know, to uh, stay within the regulations. Okay, great. Now this next one, perhaps uh, Chuck might want to answer this one. Um, it was mentioned that some US states already have approved the use of A2Ls. And can you mention some of those states or point to a website that lists the states that have approved it? Um, yeah, the, uh, and this is really uh, related to adopting of the codes. So, uh, you know, Tim did a, a good job on the codes. In the states, uh, the one that most notable talked about the most is Washington State. And, and the way building codes get updated, it's a pretty long update cycle. It's like every three years. So if you miss the update cycle, you kind of got to wait three years to get them in. But states can go ahead and adopt the... Uh, the safety standards uh, in lieu of the codes. So that's what Washington did. They basically said, you can use A2Ls according to, you know, ASHRAE standard 15, ASHRAE standard 34, uh, and then the codes will be updated during the next cycle. Uh, there's a few other leading uh, states uh, that are, are doing that similarly. Uh, I don't have off the top of my uh, head uh, a, a single place where all that is kept. Maybe the AHRI, uh, 
website, they have a lot of information and a lot of regulatory uh, kind of what's going on in the world of codes and standards across the U.S. Uh, you know, the U.S. was kind of stalled during the last uh, administration in advancing a lot of these objectives. So a lot of the states went forward since the federal government in the U.S. wasn't doing much. But now with the new administration, the CPA is going to is moving forward. So we're still waiting to see exactly what the states are going to do. Are they going to continue on the path they started down recently, or are they going to back off and let the uh, the federal government take over? But if you want to check out one Washington state, you want to look at. Okay, so that's the uh, Air Conditioning uh, Heating Refrigeration Institute, AHRI. They also have a lot of good information on their yeah. website, and uh, HRI works very closely uh, with AHRI. Um, okay, right. so our best educated guess when the Canadian codes will allow uh, field piped R32 and R. 454B and other A2L refrigerants, uh, what year? Yeah, so I guess as an educated guess, I mean, where we sit today, um, there there is some limited applications where you may be able to do this according to B52 today. However, um, the broader adoption of, of, of B52 is likely going to be completed by 2022, and then it will take some time for the provinces to adopt, uh, actually late 2022. So then it will take the provinces some time to adopt. So I would suggest we're probably looking at, you know, larger charge size, broader adoptions of A2Ls in the 2024 timeframe. Uh, it's likely in, in that area, um, which also is, is good timing because that's in alignment with the next uh, reduction in the cap and reduction in Canada, but it, it, it's probably in that time frame. So we do have time to do more training and uh, uh, that type of thing, but uh, it will be a little while yet before we see, uh, uh, you know, A2Ls uh, in larger quantities being sold through wholesalers and being installed in systems. Okay, thanks. So how is the reclaim refrigerant dealt with in terms of destruction and disposal? Okay, so uh, I'm a member of, of RMC, the organization uh, um, uh, through uh, HRAI, and certainly um, within uh, RMC, uh, that is a, a disposal program uh, for disposal of refrigerants, and uh, certainly some reclaim refrigerants that uh, come into that program or reclaimable refrigerants may also be reclaimed through some of the service providers. Um, A2L, certainly our position with these uh, A2Ls is that uh, our position is as Comores that uh, uh, A2Ls and even A3s, we don't believe they should be vented and, uh, uh, you know, regulations will likely head in that direction as well. And uh, certainly the intention will be to ensure that uh, these uh, A2L refrigerants are also recovered and, and reclaimed as well. And, and that work is going on, you know, with RMC, uh, with some of the reclaimers, et cetera. Uh, but certainly that will be the intention to, uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the, the new refrigerants are also recovered and uh, recycled or reclaimed or uh, properly disposed of uh, through programs like RMC. Yes, yeah, the RMC board is uh, just uh, starting to look into that and uh, working with other partners around the world and, you know, Australia and, and different places who have various uh, destruction technologies researching now. Um, so R290 does not need to be recovered, is that correct? But all A2Ls need to be recovered? Uh, that's a, a, an interesting question. I think that's one we're trying to understand the interpretation of it. Uh, certainly, if uh, the A2L is a blend and it contains an HFC, uh, certainly it would fall under the current regulations. Uh, there are some A2Ls that do not contain HFCs and fall under the HFO classification. And I think that's an area that needs to be understood, whether they do need to legally be recovered or not. Uh, some of the provinces may have different regulations on that, but certainly from a Comoros perspective, our position would be that uh, uh, A2Ls, whether they're HFO, HFC blends, or if they're straight HFOs, 
uh, we would uh, encourage that they be recovered and recycled, reclaimed, or et cetera, as well. Uh, on the R290 front, uh, I'm not really 100% up to speed on that, but uh, I, you know, I, I don't know for sure the answer to that question. I believe, um, well, again, I, I think mm -hmm. that's a question I don't fully understand the answer to on 290. We also have a fact sheet on uh, HRI's website that we posted about a month ago on our 290 refrigerants, and it's got a, a lot of links to uh, uh, various codes and um, actually uh, Messer uh, worked with HRI in helping to uh, to develop that and put some information out. So uh, we can also uh, direct those on the call to, to that information too. Um, so it's uh, one o'clock, uh, maybe what we'll do, can we just uh, take two more quick questions and then we'll wrap it up? Um, so are there VRF systems with low GWP refrigerants available in Canada? Yeah, I do not believe that, that VRF systems today can be installed with uh, A2Ls, uh, low GWP solutions, uh, because the uh, adoption of the appropriate codes has not been completed. And I don't believe the manufacturers are offering that equipment in Canada yet either. So I, I believe the answer to that is, is no, not until um, the later codes get uh, adopted um, for uh, you know, VRS with uh, lower GWP A2L refrigerants. Okay. And the last question is, uh, is R454B allowed in residential and light commercial equipment today in Canada and the US? Okay, so R454B, um, it is a, a 410A uh, lookalike product, I can call it that. Um, it is uh, an A2L. So again, we're limited to very small charge size equipment. So we may see that in, uh, you know, for example, window shakers or, or window units or, or self, small self-contained equipment. Uh, but in commercial rooftops or, um, you know, split systems in a home, uh, again, uh, we will not see those today, but we will see them in the future, um, uh, you know, as again, that the later regulations get adopted or codes and standards get adopted. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And that ends our questions. And uh, I guess that concludes our presentation today. And thank you uh, so much, uh, Chuck and Tim. And I hope uh, the attendees found the session to be very informative. Um, and just a reminder to uh, complete the evaluation survey that you'll see on the end of the screen. And um, yeah, so, and uh, Chuck or Tim, do you have any last comments or? Yeah, there's Tim. And again, I thank all you guys for your time today for participating, spending an hour with us. There'll be more training, I'm sure, coming around through various organizations, uh, uh, hopefully through HRAI. And again, you know, as I stated at the beginning, thank all of you guys for your efforts through thank, COVID and keeping thank, things going. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you. Well, much appreciated. And thanks, everyone. And have a good day.